Good morning. So good to see you today. Thank you for coming. And we want to extend a special thanks to our visitors for joining us today. We hope the Lord gives you a good blessing being with God's people here at White Oak. Uh, a few announcements and one correction. Uh, the abiders meeting it says it's uh, tomorrow. It's actually on the 18th, on the 18th. So that we'll be meeting uh, same place, chicken salad chick. I've never been there, but uh, I hear it's really, really good. And that's on the 18th, so make that correction to the bulletin. Uh, we have a drop-in shower, and it's a couple shower for Justin Mears and Kirsten, and we thank you uh, for supporting them in their early days of their marriage, and we uh, uh, want to honor them uh, with the shower on the 17th. Dinner on the grounds today. If you smell some things wafting up, try to pay attention uh, don't let it distract you, but everybody here is invited to this dinner. Please come and join us. Uh, it's a good old uh, dinner on the grounds, people providing side dishes, and we'll provide the main course and drinks, and uh, we'd love to have you with us downstairs at Fellowship Hall. Let me also mention that we've replenished our track rack, and I'd like to begin a new emphasis on personal evangelism, and we've gotten some really good tracks that are there. One of my favorites is a little larger track. It's called Ultimate Questions by John Blanchard. If you have someone that you're dealing with about the gospel, this is a good resource. It's a bit more than a track. It's a booklet, and I recommend that highly. We also have uh, Experiencing God's Grace, Life's Ultimate Questions, a variety of other really good gospel tracks that we've vetted very carefully. Uh, I really encourage you to go back right in this hallway here and uh, pick up a collection of those and share them with your friends and family. All right, let's stand and begin our worship and song. And once again, my admonition, please, not just sing out for loud's sake, but sing out from the heart. We're going before the throne of the living God, and we're coming and praising him for who he is and what he has done. And let's do so with exuberance and with uh, great, great enthusiasm. Let's sing.
Let's pray. Father, it's amazing love, and we cry out, how can it be that our God should die for us? We thank you, Father, for the, the birth and the life and the death and the ascension of Jesus Christ, and we thank you that he ever lives to make intercession for us. We thank you for what transpired this past week. We thank you for everything you brought into our lives. We thank you for the joys. We thank you for the struggles. We thank you for the friendships. We thank you for everything that you brought our way. And we know that you're using all things, including suffering, for our good to bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. We thank you for the relationships that have been born this week and strengthened. We pray for relationships, especially relationships with those who don't know you, that we might be able to tell them of the great redeeming love of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that those we encounter might come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and we thank you for the work on the cross that made it possible. Now, Father, I pray for this flock. Forgive us of our sins. Help us to love you with greater fervency and affection. Help us to call on you more often. Help us to spend our days in great gratitude and praise for all that you're doing for this flock. I pray for those who would dearly love to be with us today but cannot because of physical constraints. I beg you, Father, to give them great grace and great, uh, uh, a great sense of your presence with them and of our presence with them in spirit. We thank you for Sophie Glover and she was so eager that you all receive thanks from her for the many, many birthday card she received on her 104th birthday. We thank you for her long life and ministry. Now, Father, we've come together today, not just because it's Sunday, though that is one good reason, and not just because it's the appointed time for church, but we've come together today to meet with you, to engage with your word that we might find truth and that we might find grace to help in time of need. Now, Father, we pray that you would honor your word, which you have declared you honor above your every name, very name. And we pray, Father, that this word that will never perish might be alive in our lives, that penetrate us and to bring us closer to you. And we pray, Father, that if there's anyone in our building who does not know the Christ of this gospel, we ask that they might be saved today and that they might have abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.
Obviously, I'm not Paul Bernard. My name is Bob Goebel. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for all the many blessings you've given to us. We thank you for this congregation, Lord, that's gathered to worship you and to fellowship with each other. We ask your blessings upon each of them. We pray for our pastor this morning as he brings the message. May it in encourage us and strengthen us to make us better witnesses for you. Father, we come this morning thanking you for this offering that we're about to receive that's given out of love. We just pray that you would use it to spread your message here at home and throughout the entire world. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? 
Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it.
Thanks to all who participated in our music ministry today. We really appreciate it. Turn your Bibles, please, to Deuteronomy chapter 21. This is our 23rd message from our series on Deuteronomy. The title of the whole series is called Gracious Obedience, and it reflects on the two major themes that I find in the book of Deuteronomy. One is the grace of God in the lives of his people, that should be manifested by obedience to God. The Library of Congress had a special exhibit on the Magna Carta. Perhaps you remember about the Magna Carta from your days of studying history. And one exhibit talked about the concept of due process. That uh, Library of Congress statement says, due process of law is a constitutional guarantee that prevents governments from impacting citizens in an abusive way. In its modern form, due process includes both procedural standards that courts must uphold in order to protect people's personal liberty and a range of liberty interests that statutes and regulations must not infringe. It traces its origins back to chapter 39 of King John's Magna Carta, which provides that no free man will be seized, dispossessed of his property, or harmed except by the law of the land, an expression that referred to customary practices of the courts. The phrase due process of law first appeared as a substitute for the Magna Carta's the law of the land in a 1354 statute of King Edward III that restated Magna Carta's guarantee of the liberty of the subject. The Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments of the United States Constitution, which guarantee that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, incorporated the model of law that English and American lawyers associated most closely with Magna Carta for centuries. Under this model, a strict adherence to Regular procedure was the most important safeguard against tyranny. Due process. Are we to be concerned about that? Are we to be concerned about due process in this church? I hope that the answer in your mind is a resounding yes. We have ways of doing things in this church that are guaranteed by our church constitution, our church covenant, and our church bylaws. There are ways in which we proceed. It is a due process. And part of that due process is to guarantee the rights of church members. You have rights, privileges, and responsibilities as a result of being a member of this church. A more important question is, is God interested in due process? Well, let's look at a few verses that indicate that he is. Leviticus 19.15, do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. In Psalm 82, we read these words, defend the weak and the fatherless, 
Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Also, Proverbs 22. Do not exploit the poor because they are poor, and do not crush the needy in court. For the Lord will take up their cause and will exact life for life. Basically, this is a reiteration that God is concerned not just about the needy and the oppressed, but God is also concerned about fairness. People are treated fairly. The ultimate expression of this is, of course, in God's calling of people to his church. God extends the gospel call to everyone. And no one is saved because of privilege or wealth or family history or pedigree. Everyone who is saved and everyone who has been saved through the salvific history of God has been saved in the same way. By humbling themselves before the mighty hand of God and recognizing their need of salvation and trusting him, Jesus Christ, and him only for that salvation, and as was Brought forth clearly in our scripture reading today, Jesus Christ declares that because he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And no man comes to the Father, no man or woman comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. And that message is for all. There is no partiality with God. Chapter 21 is an intriguing chapter. You have five basic scenarios that at face value seem to be disconnected but I think we're going to find this morning that they are indeed connected. The first of these we find beginning in verse 1, and that resounds with the concept of righteousness or justice, only justice, and even in the situation involving unsolved murders. Let's read beginning in verse 1. If a murder victim is found lying in a field in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess, and it is not known who killed him, Guy's just found dead in the field. Tragic. Your elders and judges are to come out and measure the distance from the victim to the nearby cities. The elders of the city nearest to the victim are to get a young cow, heifer, that has not been yoked or used for work. The elders of that city will bring the cow down to a continually flowing stream to a place not tilled or sown, and they will break its neck there by the stream. Then the priests, the sons of Levi, will come forward, for the Lord your God has chosen them to serve him and pronounce blessings in his name, and they are to give a ruling in every dispute and case of assault. All the leaders of the city nearest to the victim will wash their hands by the stream over the young cow whose neck has been broken, They will declare, our hands did not shed this blood. Our eyes did not see it. Lord, wipe away the guilt of your people, Israel, whom you redeemed, and do not hold the shedding of innocent blood against them, plurals here. Then the responsibility for bloodshed will be wiped away from them. You must purge from yourselves the guilt of shedding innocent blood for you will be doing what is right in the Lord's sight. What a strange procedure. But what do we learn from this? Well, the primary concern God has is that the land and the nation must be purged, cleansed, because this killing has polluted the entire country. One commentator, Raymond Brown, offers five elements for this atoning work What do we see here? We see a process of atonement. Now, atonement, as we know, is a term that can be thought of in this way. At one meant. It's not necessarily everything that that word means, but if you'll think of it that way, atonement means now something has been brought back into one ship. There has been reconciliation, there's been purging, there's been cleansing, and now all is at peace. The elements include a concept, first of all, of responsibility. There is one crime, murder here, 
But are there not many victims? Has not a family been impacted? Has not a community been impacted? Were there not friends who were missing this man? Are there not other people who have felt this pain? And this solidarity, responsibility, leads to an element of solidarity. For example, <clears throat> most of us in this room are citizens of the United States. And let's suppose that a group of Americans, I don't think it happened, but let's suppose that a group of Americans, United States citizens, flew down to Australia during the World Cup, and while they were at the World Cup, this group of American citizens trashed bars, got into fights, turned into hooligans. Would there not be some level of shame associated with the whole country? Now, I didn't go down there and beat anybody up. I didn't go down there to some bar and get drunk. I didn't fight somebody. I didn't act like an idiot. I have no responsibility here. But in the world of the Old Testament and in the world of the New Testament, there are times in which responsibility is shared. It's communal. Now this solidarity goes on to say that one man committed the crime, but the entire nation, all Israel, has to be cleansed. It's not just, okay, we measured this and the, the, the closest city goes and does it and it's only about them. What does the Lord say? The whole land that I am giving you has now been polluted even though you don't know who committed the murder. And there must be absolution, there must be atonement, there must be purging, there must be cleansing. So the entire community, in a sense, is guilty. And are not some criminals made so, rather than just are born so? I wonder about this dead person lying in the field. Did his parents seek his betterment? We would assume they did. But what about the unknown murderer? Did his parents rear him in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord? Did they repeat Deuteronomy to him, so to speak? Did they remind him who God is? Was there a priest who could have taken this murderer under his wing and pointed him in a better direction? Was there not a community that may also share some of the blame in the fact that he went so desperately long? Now, don't get me wrong. God doesn't punish you for other people's sins. He doesn't, he says, even punish the children for the parents' sins. But there is some sense of solidarity here that perhaps this murderer committed the murder because he wasn't brought up the way he should have been brought up. We have a phrase in this country called, not in my backyard, which generally means we don't want something happening that close to us. But that cry will not suffice as an excuse. In a land that still has elements of poverty, injustice, and abuse, we must share in some of that responsibility. I love the prayers that indicate this. For example, Nehemiah chapter 1. You know the story of Nehemiah? He receives word as the king's cupbearer that the walls of his city, Jerusalem, have been decimated while his people have been captivity, in captivity. Notice Nehemiah's prayer. <clears throat> Lord, the God of the heavens, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your eyes be open and your ears be attentive to hear your servant's prayer that I now pray to you day and night for your servants, the Israelites. Now get this. I confess the sins we have committed against you. Nehemiah did not personally commit these sins against God. But his prayer of contrition was a corporate prayer. We have acted corruptly toward you and have not kept the commands, statutes, and ordinances you gave your servant Moses. Please remember what you commanded your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and carefully observe my commands, even though your exiles were banished to the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place where I chose to have my name dwell. Nehemiah goes on to pray, 
They are your servants and your people. You redeem them by your great power and strong hand. Please, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to that of your servants who delight to revere your name. Give your servant success today and grant him compassion in the presence of this man, namely the king. What's the whole point? Nehemiah is saying, I acknowledge and am in solidarity with even those who committed these sins, and I beg your forgiveness for us. Daniel did the same thing in chapter 9. Daniel says, Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy, with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God, notice how these prayers always start with an exaltation of the Lord, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments. We know by contemporary testimony that Daniel may have been the most righteous man alive at his time. He was just revered. Like, there's no righteousness like Daniel's righteousness. This guy is straight arrow, serves the Lord, and he says, we have acted wickedly. What about the New Testament? Well, how about when the Lord comes to churches, as he does in Revelation 2? To the angel, which means messenger, my personal interpretation of these messages to the churches of Revelation is that the message is coming to the primary leader of the church. This angel is not, to me, a a heavenly angel. I think the word should be translated messenger. In other words, if he were coming to talk to White Oak, he might bring the message to me. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary, yet I hold this against you. You collectively have forsaken the love you had at first. He's writing to the churches via the messenger, and that message is, consider how far you have fallen, repent, and do the things you did at first. Now, folks, my message this morning in that concept of solidarity is not that you are responsible for all the sins in our society. You're not personally responsible. You're not responsible for the wickedness that might actually be hidden in this church. But nevertheless, God calls us corporately at times to repent as a community, as a community of believers. This passage here, this first part of this passage, and we're going to spend most of our time here, we'll we'll, we'll get through all five, has a concept of substitution, does it not? The whole scene speaks of newness. You've got this unworked heifer. You have this unplowed field. You have this continuously flowing stream. It brings about newness. The whole picture where this animal is slain and people wash their hands over this animal is one of renewal. It will be back to normal. It will be covered. It will be purged. It will be cleansed. And Jesus, our substitute, we cannot ignore this picture, Jesus, our substitute, makes all things new Because he who knew no sin was made sin for us. He, the righteous, died for the unrighteous. Those whose sins were yet unknown and unforgiven and unacknowledged. Father, forgive them, he cried from the cross, for they know not what they do. And when you look at the Old Testament, you see strange pictures like this where animals are slain where there's washing over the dead animal, where there's a a cleansing process, you must find your way to the cross and understand the ultimate fulfillment of all of this. Jesus Christ died for you and took your sins upon himself and his body on the tree. 
There's an element of confession here. In one sense, God is not obligated to forgive us, to show us mercy. But then there is another way in which we could look at it and say God is obligated to do so. Why is God obligated to, con- to cleanse, confess sin? Because he has promised he would. And this is why, this is why Daniel and Nehemiah can both say, Lord, remember what you said. Nehemiah says, Lord, you told us through Moses that because of our sin we might be scattered, but if we confess that sin, you're going to bring us back. Now, folks, Jesus Christ tells us in no uncertain terms through his apostle John that if you confess your sins, that he, God, is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, his very name is at stake because he cannot lie, he cannot say something that isn't true, and he never has and never will break a promise. And this is why you can't come to the Lord or fail to come to the Lord and say, I can't confess it, it's too bad. I can't confess it, I've been confessing too many times. I can't confess it, I'm not worthy of his forgiveness. Folks, who is? Who is? And in your heart right now, you can answer out loud if you want, in your heart right now, do you believe that if you confess your sins to Jesus Christ, he will cleanse them with the blood of his very son? He will. And that confession shows us that there is indeed a cleansing. The land and the nation must be preserved Yes, the old covenant is conditional. Security is, depends upon de- obedience, but the new covenant is, in a best sense of the word, unconditional. Security is based on Christ's perfect obedience. Folks, you don't come to the Lord and claim these things on your personal righteousness. Daniel didn't, and he was absolutely righteous. You come claiming the righteousness of Jesus Christ, folks. So there are even rights that take place when somebody is murdered and we don't even know who did it and cleansing has to take place. You've got another scenario here, righteousness and marital rights. These things sound so strange to us at times, but listen carefully. He's talking to the Jews. They're about to enter the land that God has given them. Verse 10, when you go to war against your enemies and the Lord your God hands them over to you and you take some of them prisoner, which they're permitted to do, And if you, as an individual, see a beautiful woman among the captives, desire her and want to take her as your wife, you are to bring her into your house. She is to shave her head, trim her nails, remove the clothes she was wearing when she was taken prisoner, live in your house, and mourn for her father and mother for a full month. After that, you may have sexual relations with her and be her husband, and she will be your wife. Then, if you are not satisfied with her, you are to let her go where she wants, but you must not sell her or treat her as merchandise because you have humiliated her. Now again, this rings strange to us. We don't typically find our wives by going into a foreign country and conquering it and bringing some gal home. That's not what we do. But notice the respect that is shown here. Due process also implies deep respect for God's image bearers, even in horrendous situations like war. Notice what she's supposed to be shown. She is to be provided shelter, she's given new clothing, and she's provided a period of mourning, and she simply, from that point on, cannot be discarded or sold back into slavery. She cannot be treated like something that you ordered from Amazon and you sent back to be put on the shelf. She must be granted. Complete freedom. She's not faulty merchandise. She is an image bearer. And this is a strange passage to our ears. And you wonder how we can have application. I think, first of all, notice what it says. Premarital sex is forbidden even in this situation. You do not have sexual relations with her until she's had a period of mourning, until she's established herself in your household. You stay away. And these wives must be treated with respect. Eric Raymond makes this comment. 
Jesus served the church. This love wore an apron. He served his bride, the church, with his life and death. Way beyond the context of a bride taken during warfare, Jesus Christ has selected us, bought us back from the slave market of sin, as pictured in Hosea, and this Christ has now become the loving husband of the church. In Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Likewise, the husband, the leader, is to serve his wife. He is to, like Jesus, be willing to set aside his interests when presented with the opportunity to serve his wife. This writer says, think about it. We could, ever con- we could never conceive of Jesus being too busy to hear us in prayer. He's not distracted. He's not uninterested. No, he loves us and continues to listen and help us. He is always doing us good. Jesus is not too busy checking his phone, scrolling through his social media when we're trying to talk to him. He's not drifting off thinking about hobbies or work when we are pouring our hearts out to him in prayer. He's not daydreaming when we are laying bare our weakness before him. No, he is present, faithful, caring, and serving. Don't just think of the guy who's taken a bride in warfare and asking him to treat her with respect. Think about the ultimate respect, if you will, that Jesus Christ shows to his bride, the church. And he's never going to send you back. He's never going to take you in an Amazon box back to UPS and say, here, send it back. I don't even have to bother to put a label on it. That's not how Jesus operates. This writer concludes, the danger for marriages is not that the husband would love another woman more than his wife, it is that he would love himself more than his wife. And Jesus didn't. We could stay there for all week, we won't. There's a third scenario. And these last three might be connected in Moses' mind. Verse 15, if a man has two wives, we obviously had to park there. Did God permit polygamy in the Old Testament? Apparently he did, but God's custom, his mandate from creation on one man, one woman cleaving together for the rest of their lives. If a man has two wives, one loved and the other neglected, and both the loved and the neglected bear him sons, And if the neglected wife has the firstborn son, when that man gives what he has to his sons as an inheritance, he is not to show favoritism to the son of the loved wife as his firstborn over the firstborn of the neglected wife. All right, what's that all mean? Two wives. All right, the guy really loves one. Think of, you know, Rachel and Leah. Guy, Guy really loves one, doesn't love the other one so much. And by the way, the Old Testament concept of hatred is not always bitter antipathy. It simply means preference. So downstairs, and we're going to go into the Holy of Holies, which is the dessert room of the, uh, uh, and uh, I don't know if I'm going to put it in a room or not. And so I, I mean, unless I want to, you know, be a glutton, there's going to be a table full of wonderful desserts, and probably every one of them tastes great. I will love one, maybe two, I will love one, and I will essentially hate the others. I don't hate them. I'd love to indulge in them too, but they're not my preference. So it doesn't mean this guy has antipathy. It simply means there is a favorite wife. Okay. Both of them bear children, but it is the unfavored wife that truly bears the firstborn. Okay, you got it? He must acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the neglected wife, by giving him two shares of his estate, for he is the first fruits of his virility, and he has the rights of the firstborn. You can't deny the firstborn his rights just because you didn't like his mom as much as you liked the other guy's mom. It's not due process. It's not fair. It's not just. What about this firstborn thing? It's so interesting. In the Old Testament, for example, in Exodus 22, verses 29 following, You shall not delay to offer from the fullness of your harvest and from the outflow of your presses. The firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. 
You shall do the same with your oxen and with your sheep. Seven days it shall be with its mother. On the eighth day you shall give it to me. He said, well, wait a minute. What? You're supposed to give your first kid to the Lord after eight days? How's that supposed to work? Numbers 3, verse 11. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Behold, I have taken the Levites from among the people of Israel instead of every firstborn who opens the womb. The Levites now serve as the firstborn among the people. The Levites shall be mine, for all the firstborn are mine. I'm now saying I am treating Levi and his descendants as my firstborn so that all of you don't have to give me your first child. And this firstborn has some rights. Yes, they inherit a double portion of the estate, but they're also supposed to take care of their their mom when the father dies. They're supposed to keep the estate going. They're supposed to be the one who assumes the responsibilities. Moses says it's unjust to deprive the firstborn son of his rights just because you prefer the wife. And we have to remember, who is the ultimate firstborn? Is it not Jesus Christ himself? And does not Jesus Christ accept all the firstborn responsibilities for you and your behalf? So to violate the right is to undermine the prophetic fulfillment, who is Jesus And the New Testament describes Christ as the firstborn numerous times. In an earthly sense, Jesus is Mary's firstborn son, and he's dedicated according to the law. Spiritually, Jesus is the firstborn among many brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Colossians 1.15, the apostle writes, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So this firstborn title for Jesus Christ echoes the wording of Psalm 89, where the God says of King David, and I will appoint him to be my firstborn, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. I will maintain my love for him forever, and my covenant with him will never fail. I will establish his line forever, his throne, as long as the heavens endure. Answer me this, did God keep his promise to his firstborn? He did. He kept every promise to David and the lineage that would be the ultimate firstborn. And that's why in the book of Hebrews, Christ is heir of all things. He is the firstborn into the world. Now, folks, praise the living God for this principle of the firstborn, even if you're not a firstborn. I'm not either. I'm classic middle child. Well, maybe not classic, but middle child. This God said to Jesus, on the basis of your faithfulness, on the basis of your righteous life, I'm declaring you forever my firstborn. And that means Jesus Christ has the rights of the firstborn in the ultimate spiritual sense. Much more about that, we could say. But there's a fourth principle that might be linked here. What if, what if, the firstborn and his secondborn brother don't get along. What if the one who thinks he should have been firstborn because his mom was liked best turns out to be a real rascal? Does Moses have this in mind? I don't know. Verse 18, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who does not obey his father or mother and doesn't listen to them even after they discipline him, his father and mother are to take hold of him and bring him to the elders of the city to the gate of his hometown. They will say to the elders of the city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He doesn't obey us. He's a glutton and a drunkard. He's a wastrel. Then all the men of the city will stone him to death. You must purge the evil from you and all Israel will hear and be afraid. Now, if you're like me, I'm glad I live under the new covenant because I would have been stoned. All right, let's just face it. I, was a, I wasn't all that great as a son. But what we see here is a desperate situation. This son, is he referring to the previous passage, is what we might say stubbornly rebellious. The, the word could be translated utterly incorrigible. This is not just a kid who's kind of sullen. This is a grown boy, perhaps, who's absolutely contrary to his parents' wishes. The implication is clear. They tried to rear him according to the dictates of God, and he wouldn't listen. 
He's a wastrel, a glutton and a drunkard is an indication that he wastes his family's resources and he's wasting his community's resources as well. Now notice that both parents, indicating the elevation of the wife's position here, are the ones who have to bring him. And the elders pass judgment. The ultimate decision is the elders. The responsibility for punishment is communal, not familial. It's not the right of people to do this. I read of a tragic story that happened just recently. There was a woman from Iraq, and she moved to another country. She married. She became very well known on YouTube. She was a YouTube influencer, had tens of thousands of followers. She wanted to go back and visit her family in Iraq. While she was home, in her sleep, her father strangled her to death because she had, in her, his mind, she had uh, brought shame upon the family. And he was sentenced to a whopping six months in prison because the Iraqi government said, well, this was actually unpremeditated. Due process. This land has to be purged from this kind of evil in the midst of Israel. What was the crime here? The son had trampled underfoot one of God's Ten Commandments. He's brought potential punishment on the entire community because the community has now allowed someone to spit in God's face. His punishment, death by stoning, is mean, means that justice has been done and must be done to purge. Now again, we're not dealing with that kind of punishment for rebellion in this country or in the New Testament economy. But have you thought about this? That all we, like sheep, have gone astray? That we are rebellious? Will you acknowledge that before your salvation you were a rebel by nature and a rebel by choice, as I was? We deserve death for the insults to a loving Heavenly Father. But thanks be to God, his justice and mercy have kissed one another. He can be just and the justifier of those who believe because he has laid on his son the iniquities of us all. This young man suffered the punishment for his sins so that God would not have to curse the land. But in a realer sense, if you will, a more real sense, God was obligated because of his holiness and righteousness to punish sin. He cannot wink at it. He simply cannot overlook it. So how, the question Paul poses, how can he be just and at the same time the justifier of those who believe? He can do both because Jesus Christ was made sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And we've seen it over and over foreshadowed in this book of Deuteronomy the horror of the cross as well as the glory of the cross. Folks, have we really gotten this to grip our hearts and souls? That in three hours on the cross, in ways we cannot begin to imagine, Jesus Christ bore the hell we deserve. It's unfathomable to contemplate that. What's our fifth scenario? Perhaps this young man's body is now lifted up. We don't know. If anyone is found guilty of an offense deserving the death penalty and is executed, and you hang his body on a tree, that word tree there doesn't necessarily mean a literal tree, it could be anything like a cross or anything that is a pole lifted up, if you will. You are not to leave his corpse on the tree overnight, but are to bury him that day, for anyone hung on a tree is under God's curse. Now the order here is not that you're cursed because you were hung on a tree, you're hung on the tree because you're cursed, is how I take the meaning. You must not defile the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Where would the defilement come from? The defilement would come from him hanging on a tree to the point of physical corruption. His body would begin to rot. This was the custom throughout all this world. You just hung your victims up and exposed them to the elements and to the birds of the, of the air. 
Displaying this body is indeed compassionate to a sense because the people are warned and there is justice and purging. But the removal of the body is also compassionate. The parents here are spared grief, continued grief by seeing their son there. The land is kept free from corruption. And this slain image bearer is shown due respect. Though he deserved death, though he would deserve capital punishment, though God's justice came down, he still treated with respect. His body is taken down. And the solemnity and gravity of the process is ensured. Folks, I was thinking about sometimes when we have notorious criminals who are executed, that there are people who come together and almost treat it like a party. I was reading the account of when Ted Bundy was executed, a horrible serial killer. And you had people gathering outside the prison knowing he was going to be executed at a certain time in the morning, holding up placards, people with frying pans, smacking on the frying pans because he's going to the electric chair. They're turning this execution into some kind of raucous party. No, 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 no. It's too solemn an occasion for that. We don't rejoice in this. But folks, was not Jesus Christ hanged on a tree? Of all the possible ways in which Jesus could have been executed, he was hung on a tree. Why? I think to demonstrate this covenantal curse that rested upon him for our sake. That's why Paul says in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Now Paul substitutes the curse of God with the curse of the law, that which binds us to this flesh and says, you have not pleased God, you have broken my commandments, and God's curse is justifiably on you. But in a great and amazing grace, this curse was placed on Christ. And the gospel is displayed in the starkest forms and in the most specific terms. The innocent and blessed Son of God was hung on a tree as though he were a reprehensible, vile criminal and he suffered this unspeakable experience of the wrath of God, and he did so in place of those of us who ourselves are heinous criminals, deserving the wrath of God. You say, Pastor, you say something like that almost every week. It's all I've got, folks. It's all I have. Is Jesus Christ on the cross bearing my sin that I might be delivered from the curse of God and not suffer for my sins, but enjoy the life of covenantal love with him now and forever. I've got nothing else, folks, but Christ and him crucified. That's all I've got. And it's why I'm going to mention it every sermon, because it is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power of God to salvation to anyone who believes. And Peter declares he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Praise be to God. Can we conclude this message in any other way or any better way than this? I'm going to read Isaiah 53 for you. All right? Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. 
Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before his shears is silent, so opened he not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence. And there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be acquaint, accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Praise be to God for Jesus Christ the righteous. Let's pray. Father, like the people of Israel and like the land you promised them, we need cleansing. We need reconciliation. We need expiation. Father, we need the removal of sin. And Father, we thank you for what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And Father, it's with grief that we contemplate that death for us, but it's with joy unspeakable and full of glory that we bask in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you that you so loved the world that you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, and that whoever believes in him will never perish, but will have eternal life. <clears throat> Father, we thank you and Father, we pray that we'll give this message to whoever will listen. And Father, if there's anybody in the room who's never trusted this Christ, has not known the forgiveness of sins, I beg you, Father, in Jesus' name to save them. It's in that name we pray, and it's in that name we exalt, and it's in that name we rejoice, and it's in that name we come before you, because there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen.